Now, going uh, going forward, um, I, I don't want to give away too much of the documentary because we want to we want to sell some copies. But um, uh, going forward on these tours and and the guys that are that are working the Canadian independence today, who's out there that we should be keeping an eye on in the next two three years? To make a big evening or or just who who's some because you're you're a pretty good judge of talent and yeah based on based on what you've seen in the last two or three years, which guys work in the indie scenes in uh, in western Canada do you think have the best shot of 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 making it well, you see the way it works is this way uh is that if you see a guy who's got a lot of talent and I mean a lot of talent doesn't mean he's going to make a dig. Believe me, doesn't work that way anymore. Uh, you have to know somebody at the company, like WWE, uh, that gives you a tryout and gives you that push, gives you uh, the starter. Otherwise, forget it. Never make it. Doesn't matter how good you are. It's just a break. It's a, I'll give you a different example. Uh, a lot of the bars, uh, the, you got a lot of singers, and I mean good singers, right? Uh, it's not like I, because I go to bars, but, you know, like, just presuming you got a good singer. Now, if it happens that a promoter that uh, likes your singing and he picks you up, you go, you're made, right? But if nobody catches on to you or whatever, you're still going to be singing in bars here in Winnipeg. And that's right. You need the break. You need that break. And, of course, you know, with Vince McMahon, he's got uh, thousands of people that want to work for his firm. Because they can hack that is, you know. I worked for him for a year and a half, and I said, "Mr. McMahon, we'll still be friends, but I can hack your bullshit, right?" And like, you know, I was done. <laughs> Actually, I was the first guy that brought him here in Winnipeg, Winnipeg Arena, back in the uh, thing was eighty three, nineteen eighty three, right? Because that's that, cause that's when they were they were they were stepping away from the AWA uh, loop, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, AWA is another another story there. They had a business. Well, it seems like Vince McMahon ran a lot of people out of business in the 1980s, which I, I guess that's one of the other reasons that your name is so legendary is that a lot of other wrestling promoters folded up shop and decided they didn't want to compete with Vince, but you kept right on going. Yeah, I know. I know. But I'm still going for whatever it's worth. You know what I'm saying? But uh, uh, I used to produce uh, maybe 200 matches a year in my, in my time. Now I cut it down to maybe 20, 15, or 30. You know, that's about it. Getting too old for the shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I understand, but it's good that you're still in it and still love it, even if you're not doing it to the depth that you might have been 10, 15 years ago. But it's glad that you're still involved in it, even if it's at a reduced amount. They call me the oldest promoter still doing it and be 73 in another couple of months. And uh, I still like to go in the ring and kick some ass with his young bucks, you know what I'm saying? There you go. Absolutely, yeah. Wow, it will, it'll be kind of hard, but I still could do it. <laughs> sure, well, you know, they don't say. That. I mean, that's not that's not that old. I mean, WFWA brought in Gene Kaniski to work uh, to work six man, and, 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 and he kicks there's ass. A, there's some story there with Gene. I do recall with Mr. Joe Yellow and um, uh, Nick Bachwinkle. I had him on uh, commentary on the on the TV show. So Nick Buckley was say, Tony, why don't you bring my friend from Edmonton? I says, who? Jim Kaniski. Because I never seen him for a long time, he told me. Right? Bring him in as a special guest referee. I did. Very, very good gentleman. Right? As a matter of fact, uh, Nick Buckley was say, Tony, go to Gene and ask him to put his boots on. Instead of refereeing, ask him to wrestle, see what he says, right? So I did. So Mr. Kaniska, I said, look, you know, it's all young guys here, and you're a legend in wrestling, you know, the best Canadian wrestler there is. Would you mind if you put on your boots and uh, your trunks and uh, give this young guys a couple lessons? Uh, they, you know, they, they'd be more than, oh, they'll never forget it for the rest of their lives. He said, he's just to me, he says, Nick Buckwinkle put you up to this. He caught me in the act, right? I said, yeah, he did, actually. And he did. And actually, I got a, I have his last taping of Jim Kaniski in my books today. And then after that, he died on me, right? Two oh, years man. later. Wow. Well, there's, there's a lot of guys that you've worked with that are unfortunately no longer with us. Uh, one of them famously is Bruiser Brody, and we all know what happened to him in Puerto Rico. But before that time, he, he did some work for you as well. He did. Uh, here's a guy now, Bruiser Brody. Uh, I had him in Winnipeg Arena and uh, other places. 
At the end of the show, you know what he tells me? He says, Tony, if you haven't got enough money or no money at all to pay me now, don't worry about it. Send me a check later on. That's the type of guy that he was. And I said, Mr. Brilliant says, uh, why a lot of promoters, they say after they book you, 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 you don't show up. He says, Tony, I never missed a book in my life. But when they do, some promoters, they use my picture, pretend I'm going to be there to draw the crowd. And that's why I'm not there, but I was never booked. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was it. Then, uh, you know, he gets killed in Puerto Rico, right? There you go. Yeah. And he told me, I when, when he was with me, he says, Tony, he says, I'm going to Japan for two, three weeks. When I come back, he says, I want you to be my partner. We're going to open a big company, he says. But it never never happened because the poor guy died, right? Yeah. It's a he, shame. Sort of, he sort of liked me, right? So there you go. Mm-hmm. Bruce Brody. Yeah, he was a heck of a man. Everybody's got a good story about him, and that's a good one, too. So, I, you know, it's a, a lot of respect for him from both Rowan and I being old school fans that we remember those yep. days when mm-hmm. he was really big on television. Uh, Rowan, sounded like you wanted to chime in, so go ahead. Uh, well, you know, I, I unfortunately, I, I, I didn't get a chance to see a lot of Brody until later on with uh, with uh, tape trading. But uh, he, cer- he certainly sounded like uh, like a, a, a class guy. Yeah, he's very, very, very close to the, the, the guy. I'll tell you. Well, I never, I knew who I knew who he was, and maybe knew who I was. I do not know, but I do remember at the end of the match. You know, if the, the crowd was down, for example, because they did not the crowd at that time, the fans did not believe that he was going to be here. You understand? So uh, the Winnipeg crew was only do about two thousand people at that time, maybe twenty five hundred. Forgot now. But it was around there, which is not very much, right, for a big premise like that. And he turned around and he said, if you haven't got any money to pay me now, Tony, don't worry about it. Pay me later. So <laughs> I just met the guy and he tells me that. So don't tell me that, you know, he, he's a very classy type of guy. Well, hey, Rowan, I got one name that you will probably know a little better if you didn't get a chance to see Brody until the tape trading days, Bulldog Bob Brown. I know that Tony oh, can yeah. tell us. I know he can tell us a lot about working with Bob Brown. We could do a whole Bob chapter Brown. on Bobby. Bob Brown was one of a kind. He's, uh, he came from, uh, actually in the, in the, in the late 60s, I wrestled him quite a few times at the Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame, uh, uh, gym, uh, it was called, uh, Notre Dame, uh, I forgot what, but anyway, it was in, it was in St. Boniface. And I remember one night I had my parents, uh, they're both gone now, but, uh, he says, Tony, tonight I'm going to kick the daylights out of you, he says to me. It was a mixed tag, yeah, one middleweight to one heavyweight, right? Actually, it was me and Red Deacon, which he passed away too now. And there was uh, Bulldog Bob Brown and a guy named Al Torres, whatever. He gave me so many chops until my chest was bleeding. You know what I'm saying? And I do remember my uh, beautiful mother. She took her, her high heels trying to come in to the ring. And there was Bulldog trying to kick us. Don't you dare kick us, my mother, or so. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyway, that was Bulldog Bob Brown, you know. But he had his own way of doing things. And I remember one time, one time, a poor guy started to sweat in one of my matches. And uh, we, were, we were inside an air-conditioned uh, room, and he was sweating like crazy. All of a sudden, this appears, he goes downstairs, and uh, he gets a heart attack, believe it or not, before he died. And there the ambulance comes along and he's foaming from his mouth. While he's taking him away, he says, Tony says, uh, the show's got to go on. Can you give me an advance? (laughs) 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 That was was incredible. (laughs) That was incredible. The guy's dying, he wants an advance. (laughs) But anyway, that that was a bulldog. We had a lot of of fun with that guy. But he worked hard. He worked hard. He was from the old school. One remark that he made, I remember he was... uh, Bulldog was on the card, and so was Chris Jericho, right? So, uh, you know, Chris Jericho, the type of wrestler that he is, you know, he flies around, blah, 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 right? So Bulldog Bob Brown says to Chris Jericho, kid, they're never going to make it because you're doing too many bumps <laughs> before Chris hit big, right? <laughs> it wasn't his time, you know, uh, it wasn't his, he wasn't his wrestling to Bulldog Brown. You know, he was a headlock, body slam, that's about it. You know what I'm saying? And he, he figured the, 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 if a guy is flying too much, right, which they do, he's never going to make it big. And look what happened, right? <laughs> well, maybe one day Jericho will make it. <laughs> yeah, one of his days. Yeah, he's going to make a few more, a few more, a few more millions. 
Yeah, right. He's <laughs> he's he's a young up and comer, right? <laughs> yeah. Another time, I do recall Joe Yellow uh, after his match at the Winnipeg Arena uh, with uh, Chris Jericho. We we booked him at uh, kind of the end because he, you know he's got a band and he sings, right? Chris Jericho. So we sold out completely. Anyway, I'm there listening to this kid. And I'll tell you, people are screaming like crazy. But I did not understand one word of his singing. <laughs> so I says, Chris, after inside the dressing room, says, Chris, I know people are going crazy for you, man. They're clapping, cheering, and whatever. But I did not understand one word that you were saying. He says, Tony, I, didn't, I never understood one word from you for the last 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> you be right back, eh? And that was, that was Chris Jericho. Yeah. There's one there's one incident I need to ask you about, and it's something that we brought up with Joe a couple of weeks ago. And I just wanted to get your side of it because you know each story each story has has two different sides. Oh yeah, um, sometimes ten. <laughs> <laughs> Jethro Hogg and the pig. <laughs> Jethro Hogg and the pig. Yeah, they tell, play a good rhythm. That story. Probably where in this gymnasium, of course, in, in the reserve, and this guy that just got his that pig that he used to. You know, come to the ring with, and I told him, I had to get that goddamn pig out of here. He stinks like a pig, but of course he was a pig, right? But anyway, well, what, what's going on? Uh, the boys, you know, I'm dead tired. I mean, you know, go, 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 and I'm in my little suite, which is the gym floor in one corner, sleeping like crazy, right? Snoring. So what the boys do, okay? They put a trail of cookies in the gym, right up to my crotch. We blew this or not. They let the pig loose. And of course, what the pig is going to do? Eat all the cookies, right? Until he comes to me in my crotch and he starts, you know, uh, sniffling, right? I, I figured I was dreaming, but still, me sound asleep. That wasn't good enough for them, right? But anyway, what happens now when they do, they pull another trail of cookies where my face was. Plus, on top of it, they uh, sprayed uh, some color uh, foam in my hair, yellow, right? But anyway, the pig comes along chewing his cookies until he get, gets close to my face. And I, tur- I, I I open my eyes, and what do I see in front of me? Face of a pig. You see somebody screaming like me, you never dream, I'll tell you. I jump 10 feet in the air. <laughs> Meanwhile, the boys are hiding. They're hiding in the gym, right? Because they know that like, well, I'm going to lose my cool, right? But anyway, they're hiding. I remember me grabbing a hockey stick. And that thing was one storm around and whatever it was. And I started swinging like, you were rotten, so and so. Anyway. I go in the washroom, I go in the washroom to clean up a bit, and I look in the mirror, my my hair is yellow. I says, God damn it, the bloody pig piss on my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, that was one of the jokes, hell for a hog, and this pig, that pig. Well, and another, like, another portion of the documentary kind of um, goes into, uh, I guess, the fact that what, what other boss can the wrestlers pull off these kind of ribs with? Like, you're never going to see well, against... a guy like me, you see, no, 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 no way. A guy like me, when I go on the road, I cannot, honestly, I try to be the boss. I can't. I can't do it, which is wrong. You understand? Uh, to be very, very successful like Vince, and plus you need the money behind you, the wrestlers don't go near Vince at all. He's, I, he's got agents, and here's your piece. You go do it, but you want to talk to Vince like uh, going... Uh, uh, to Rome and talk to the Pope. You don't go near the guy. He doesn't want to know anybody problems, right? Here's your routine. Make sure you do it right because otherwise the agent that he has, they all report to the head office. But when I go up north, I become them. I'm friendly with everybody. You know what I'm saying? Joke around and, you know, playing ribs with each other to make the time fly. You know what I'm saying? But if I had to be the boss, I wouldn't sleep with them. I go get my own bloody place and stay away from them, right? But I can, I can do that. <laughs> Don't ask me why. This is me, right? Well, I think, I think it's like it's good that these uh, that these guys that are they're coming up in the business, they can see that you know the sort of dues that they're willing to pay is the same sort of thing that that you know the boss is willing to do as well. So you lead yeah. by example. But when they leave me and they have a chance to go to Vince, I always tell them I always tell them a little story. I say, guys, with Vince McMahon or any other bigger promoter, remember five little things. And obey them. Otherwise, they'll kick the, they'll, they'll kick you out right away. The final thing is, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. What time you want me to be there? Do your job in the ring and mind your own bloody business. No telltales. And you know what? 
If that guy likes you and you have that talent, he'll make you a millionaire. Some of them break those five rules, and out they go. But if they remember those five little things that I told them, hey, and if you're good and that guy likes you, of course you're going to make it. Yeah, you, you, have take it. A, you take a look at the history of people in this business who have made it, and they and uh, a lot of them probably have, have uh, lived lifestyles and had a set of rules that basically go just like that. Oh, yeah. Some of those guys that made a big, I'll tell you, they they listen exactly what I told them. Actually, one of them was Edge and Christian and Chris Jericho. Those are the guys that remember those five rules that I told them and they saw what happened. And today, they're, like I said, they're millionaires. And Plus, they have that say, talent. Yeah. yeah, I think we could say that for Lance Storm, too, because he talks a lot about you. Lance, so. Lance, 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 Lance Storm, I'm going to take nothing away from him. He's a hell of a wrestler. Hell of a wrestler. But I told him one thing to Lance Storm. Lance is never going to make it with Vince McMahon. They'll never forget my words. The reason for it, you're not going to make it you cannot cut an interview properly. That's it. And that's what he was missing. And they had to let him go. Simple as that. Yeah. See, but, but, 80%, 80 percent is your interviews on camera, right? Right. That's what makes you. 80 percent. 20 percent is the talent. But 80 percent is your interviews. If you don't know how to talk, like me, <laughs> you're never going to make it. But for well, real, then, that's true, though. Well, in, 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 uh, in 2003... Uh, they were basically doing an angle about Lance's, I guess, inability to do interviews. So that would have been the perfect time for you to come in and be and be his his mouthpiece. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got to cut your own thing, man. You gotta you gotta know how to talk in front of like some guys are incredible. They are incredible interviewers. They can all wrestle. They're as good as the the next guy, but they're incredible. Scott Norton cannot be. Uh, he cannot cut an interview. He stutters when he sees that camera, believe it or not. He stutters. He used to anyway. I don't know if he still does. And that's so, about it. So what is Tony Candelo doing these days? You're still... You're what, still uh, what, what are you doing these days to keep busy? Are you, are you still uh, on the road? Are you still promoting shows? Well, what, do, what do you have coming up? Yeah, he told us he's still doing 20 to 30 a year, so that's he's still staying busy with that. Yeah, I do about, like I said, 50 to 20 matches, maybe 30 a year. And, uh, you know, reservations or other place, or other place that they buy the show for me, right? I don't go uh, on the road uh, hoping that I'll draw a crowd. I won't do that anymore, right? I did. Cost a lot of money. Do a lot of money doing that. But, uh, somebody wants a show, there's no problem. Uh, depends on uh, who they want. They want to see the midgets, the ladies, or, you know, some famous, uh, guys from 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 uh, WWE, there's no problem. I can book practically anybody uh, from WWE that is not under contract with Vince, of course. Otherwise, you cannot use them. Uh, there's a cost for everything, right? And the most uh, expensive uh, cost is not the wrestlers anymore. It's the transportation, the plane fares, the gas, the vehicle, whatever. That's the killer. Mm -hmm. But I still do, like I said, 15, 20 times a year. And plus, I give the kids an educational program free of charge with a package. Like I said, we talk about drugs and uh, uh, alcohol and gang-related and stay away from the bad things, right? As a matter of fact, uh, coming up, uh, shortly I'm going to open up a company, a non-profit organization uh, called the, uh, going to be called the uh, uh, Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal Kids Fund, which means I do shows and the percentage of the gates that goes to... Uh, uh, to the sun for the kids, Aboriginal kids up north. And the only people that suffer up there is not the people themselves, it's the kids. Chief and Council, they're, they're fat and huge, right? But when it comes to the kids, some of them are starving in the morning, believe me. So it's in progress we open this company, which I mean, will be very successful. I hope anyway. Yeah, well, we're, we're certainly hoping for, for a lot of major success out of this. So, um, Stevie, do you have anything else? Oh, no, I think we've uh, actually gone a little past the time that we <laughs> agreed upon. So I, I want to thank Mr. Candelo for being so generous with his time and uh, given the opportunity as we wrap up the interview to uh, make any plugs, you know, plug the documentary so more people can see it and anything else you'd like to mention. Well, you know what? Some people that are interested about a wrestling show, and I'm, I'm talking about some very good workers like the, the ninjas, the, the, the ladies and whatever. I got some Aboriginal wrestler. I got some Aboriginal... Uh, lady wrestlers, whatever they want to see, if it's possible, I can book them. You know what? I can give my phone number and then give me a call if you don't mind. 204-229-9173. It's my cell phone and 
I don't answer the phone. It means I'm busy. I leave a message. I'll get back at you. Leave your phone number. Yeah. For any, like I said, any, any, anything like that, they can give me a call anytime. That's that's terrific. Now, the name of the documentary is called The Promoter, the Tony Candela story. How can people get a copy of this? Just give me a call. Just give me a call. I'll make sure, I, I make sure they, they, they get it. Yeah, it's only 20 bucks anyway. So. $20 for, yeah, $20. for that. Yeah, $20. It's a steal. I would, uh, I would recommend that anyone go out, go to the pocket, take out that, uh, that green bill if you're in Canada and, uh, <laughs> send it Tony's way. You're going to get a quality show. And you're going to learn about yeah. wrestling too because he, it's wrestling history right there. And don't forget, I was lucky enough to get a, uh, I'll just say first prize for the documentary in the Vancouver Film Festival. I still can't believe it, but the judges must be Italians. <laughs> <laughs> See, an award winning documentary. Go out and buy it. The promoter, the Tony Candela story. Thanks so much for coming on, Tony. Much success in the future. Yes, thank you, Tony. Yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Have a good night. Good night. That was just fantastic, Rowan. That a great interview with Tony Candela. Uh, he told a lot of great stories and we got to hear all about the documentary and the death tours. So I'm, I'm just tickled pink right now. <laughs> 